Welcome to Borderlandia, the podcast where we embark on a journey to explore and celebrate the cultural heritage of the borderlands. I'm your host, Alex LaPierre, and I'm thrilled to have you join us on this immersive exploration of the rich tapestry that makes up our binational region. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Alex LaPierre. I'm the founder of Borderlandia, a binational organization dedicated to building public understanding here of the borderlands. And today we're joined by a very special guest again, uh, Jack Williams from the Center for Spanish Archaeology. Uh, he participated in several different archaeological uh, excavations in the community of Tubac, Arizona, which is located in between Tucson, Arizona and Nogales, Arizona in southern Arizona. And today, the subject of our podcast is going to be in regards to his archaeological discoveries and excavations in the barrios of Tubac, the historic neighborhoods. Jack, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk to you about this subject. It's my pleasure to be here. Awesome. So when we talk about the barrios, let's, let's start from the very basic. What is a barrio in Spanish and what, what is a barrio here in Tubac, Arizona? What is that this word describing? Well, I think I may have been the person to have introduced it into Tubac because at the time, not a whole lot of coherent discussions were going on of the Urrutia map, which of course shows the community clustered around two separate plazas. And these two plazas are actually separated by an arroyo. And in studying the Urrutia maps, I had seen several of them which talked about neighborhoods and use the word barrio. So I thought it would be suitable to use that same term, even though it was not specifically used in connection with the, the map of Tubac, it was other Urutia maps. So I suggested that we talk about a northern barrio and a southern barrio. And eventually we, we probably excavated approximately 14 different structures in the south barrio to some extent, not comprehensively, of course. And then probably a half dozen in the northern barrio we tested. So we slowly started to get a handle on some of the differences and it was very interesting. And of course, I was particularly interested in how that map had been created. And uh, one of the things I discovered quickly was that while the topography was very carefully shown on the northern barrio in Tubac, the southern barrio on the map appears to be totally flat, but in reality, it's also sitting on top of a little mesa. And uh, one of the other things that was quite exciting was to see that the center of the town, which at the time of the Arutia map was in the northern barrio around the commandant's house and, and the chapel, but by the 1870s and 80s, the center of the town had moved down to where that arroyo was. So the town really had a centralized cluster in the in the area that's sort of a dead space in between the two barrios on the on the Arutia map. So um, to kind of give people a little bit of a geographical perspective, when we talk about the North Barrio, that would be to orientate oneself. Visiting today in Tubac, you would see St. Anne's, where if we consider that historic plaza to be the center of historic Tubac. You have St. Anne's uh, in front of you. You have the Chubac Presidio State Historic Park are right there. So the North Barrio would basically be north from that central plaza. Is that correct? It would be It would be on that central plaza and would include everything on the northern side of the Arroyo. So you, you can imagine the town divided in half with the southern half being the South Barrio and the northern half being the North Barrio. That's probably the easiest way to, to think about it. And they did fall in a very organic way because they surrounded open plazas, which were clearly the central area of each one of those little clusters. And you pretty much the, the demarcation, the differentiation between the two barrios, you say, is due to the, the natural arroyo that exists separating them. Yeah, the, the arroyo divided them up. And for, I think, obvious flood reasons, it was not a good place to put buildings. And in the Anglo period, they put them in there. But um, my impression is they probably got flooded pretty regularly. But there are ruins of those buildings in between the two. 
and they clearly date from the artifacts you can find around them to the more, much more to the 1870s to um, circa 1900 up to the time of the Baca float land movement when they were all all the population was driven out of there and back into the north barrio and you mentioned the Arutia map, the 1767 map that, that we have of the earliest depiction of kind of the urban morphology of the community of Tubac, the garrison place. You know, on that map, I think I've counted probably approximately 60 different dwellings and about 60 milpas. What, what are some of the, the things that stood out for you in the archaeological investigations? Are there certain buildings or dwellings that stood out to you? Well, what, what you could clearly see was that the places where the map indicated there were structures, and virtually all of them, we were able to identify the structures were there. They were within maybe a meter off of being absolutely right on the position we could determine. But um, what we also discovered was in both the northern and the southern barrios, there were lots of earlier and later structures dating into the Spanish and Mexican periods, and of course, even more recently, in those locations. So there was a lot of archaeological material from different time periods. The other thing that we could see very clearly was that, structurally speaking, not all of the buildings that are shown on the Rutia map would probably be um, like conventional adobe structures with cobblestone footings and um, azoteas. What we saw was a lot of evidence for a more more or less less formal sort of hakal or chosa. And... Um, these structures had wattle and daub walls and roofs, and they frequently used some larger stones to anchor them, which we would find alignments for. And these same sorts of informal structures have been seen at other presidios by people like Rex Gerald and, of course, Charles de Peso at Santa Cruz de Terranate. A great number of the structures there are the same sort of informal jacales, I guess, in colonial times. Of course, when Uruti made the map, he, the, the exterior of the buildings look identical. So he assumed that they were all kind of adobe buildings and he shows them as such. But it was clear that they weren't. What would you say would be the percentage of the, the Waddle and Dobb buildings compared to the, you know, the, the, the four more formal of cobblestone footed adobe brick buildings? My guess is it would be really difficult to, to estimate because making the story more complicated was the fact that there was tons of structures that aren't on the maps because they were earlier or later. Probably one of the more interesting things we found was there was pretty clear evidence that the South Barrio was the, was the first area, probably the site of the Visita of Tubac. So the, the Northern Barrio, my guess is, may have been built at the time of the Presidio's uh, construction. But in any event, um, what we found there, which was really exciting was we were able at a number of points to find the acequia that runs on the Urutia map along the edge of the town. And what we found in the South Barrio was a large upright pole construction, probably would have been described as a palisado, and it was cut by that ditch, which means it had to have dated to before the ditch was there. And we also found quite an assembly of, of artifacts there, including a, a, a pectoral bronze uh, crucifix and other stuff. And then it just so happened that that area was under a very large midden, which had been created by the structures on the top of the bluff. And we'd seen this in other presidios that we studied, that people tended to take their trash and debris and throw it right outside their houses on hillsides. And this, in a way, helped to build up the land area that was flat. But it also led to these, uh, you know, it was about meter and a half deep solid Spanish colonial trash. It was quite amazing. It was the most productive area of the entire site in terms of artifacts. And they were all dating to the period of mm, probably from the 1750s to 1820s or 30s. There wasn't a whole lot of intrusive Anglo-American ceramics. And those start to show up in sites in the mm, 1820s, it seems, is about the time that we start to see a, a real influx of Anglo-American trade wares. And, and so this was pre that. So it was really quite amazing. And it produced all sorts of artifacts, bronze artifacts and ceramics and just an amazing array of stuff. But all of that had accumulated from one of those informal housing clusters on top of the hill. 
they'd been throwing their trash out that direction and it built up. Jack, you mentioned this palisado style construction. Could you describe that for our listeners as well? Palisado constructions are buildings made with upright elements like logs. So basically there were a series of logs set in, and you could see the patterns of the, uh, the placement of those logs and they were slightly offset center. So um, the walls may have been to some extent infilled with mud, but in contrast with a hakal or a choza, they're more informal and they're, they're more like branches of almost even bushes and, and, and things on small diameter. And they're, they're very, actually, if you've ever been around buildings like that, there's, there's, there's not much uh, insulation, so to speak, because it's really just a kind of bric-a-brac interwoven surface with, with mud veneered on it. As I said, in, to uh, an observer like Aruti, it would have all looked like adobe buildings, but in reality, they were much more informal. And you can still see buildings like this in use in parts of Latin America. Yeah, I believe at Tumacacri, they have a reconstruction of a Hakal structure there too, which is really fascinating to be able to visit, to get an understanding of what these barrio buildings must have been been like. Yeah, I don't recall seeing that. But... Yeah, I think it was put in the early 90s. Yeah, that's why I haven't seen it. <laughs> One of the things that you've mentioned in prior presentations is the um, the presence of what you've termed hornos castellanos. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? What that is? This was um, a fascinating structure, which was on the top of that hill, next to the um, where where there had been a obvious a large domestic habitation, but probably mm, about I don't know thirty forty feet west of there, there was a walled compound and. It didn't appear on any maps, but my impression from the artifacts and, and the ones we found that probably dated to uh, around 1780s or 90s and probably had been abandoned sometime in the mid 19th century. But this walled compound had within the center of it a very distinct kind of structure, which was uh, it's referred to in mining history as an orno castellano. It, it was essentially a furnace type ore roasting oven. And one of the problems you have with certain kinds of ores that are fairly common in Southern Arizona is they're not amenable to the mercury amalgam process, which uh, is, you know, using the mercury amalgam process, you crush the ore, mix it with a slurry with mercury, and then you collect the mercury, heat the mercury, evaporate the mercury, and it leaves behind like silver or gold, both can be used in the mercury amalgam process. But certain ores you can't do that with. And for those kinds of ores, the easiest way to process them is essentially build a big furnace, and then you essentially create a huge amount of heat, and it causes the ore to sweat the, the, the metal. We actually found one small, it was like, um, size of a, almost a 22 caliber bullet of silver near the mouth of this thing. And of course, the entire hillside area, and I suspect it still is, is, is solid slag. There was more slag there than I saw anywhere else on the site. And it was also curious that we thought it might have dated to the post era, but as a whole, the more we looked at it, it was pretty clear it was earlier than that. One of the amazing things that we found in it underneath the floor of this thing under a couple of little structures that were inside this compound, we found a Zuni bear fetish, which had been ritually damaged. And that would have been consistent with somebody from New Mexico being there, knowing something about you know Zuni religion, and probably having some um, issue that caused them to, to damage this fetish and bury it that way. It was quite peculiar. But, um, you know, if you go back into the historical record of Tubac, there are New Mexicans during the colonial period that are getting over there. They're getting into the Santa Rita uh, Mountains, and they're also getting to Tubac. And so another thing we found both in the Tubac excavations and in the Tucson excavations that I did at the Presidio there was a small amount of, of Zuni polychrome. And when I first found it, I thought, this is odd. I was almost thought somebody had been salting the site with you know, uh, New Mexican pottery, because it seems so odd. But if you go back in many of the inspection papers and things, they talk about the New Mexican connection. So there were a few people getting through the Tubac 
and it was leading to the redistribution of a little bit of objects like that. So in any event, a uh, lot, lot of unexpected things. And this compound with that, that fetish that you said dates likely to the later period of colonial Tubac, 1780s, 1790s, this was located near the southern, somewhere near the southern Barrio district is, is, is what, you're, what you're saying, or the northern? Oh, it was definitely pretty close to the center of the South Barrio. It was, um, if you know the area, there's a huge disturbance created in the site by a trenching or flood control channel. It runs right through the South Barrio, and it was right on the banks of that. It was partially damaged by that, but mostly intact in there. And it had a very clear cobble footing. It was really obvious. And the, the furnace itself was just classic. I had seen a similar furnace in Southern California at, at a mining camp that was, in, was more intact. So I, I kind of recognized what it was. And um, at one point, we did have a couple of mining people come out there. One of the amazing things about Tubac in general and both the North and South Barrio is there's the silver ore virtually everywhere. But very little of that silver ore is from the direct area of Tubac. It's from all over Southern Arizona. And it really speaks to the fact that the soldados were bringing back ore. They were all, you know, miners as much as chasing Indians when they were out in the back country. So my guess is that they brought a lot of high-grade ore that they saw back, and they would you know, process it in small amounts. Now, one of the odd things about Tubac in general is there is not any obvious arastras in the town. And I kind of wondered what the heck could happen. But little by little, talking to locals and things, my guess is perhaps as late as the 1930s, there, there still were. And there were several places in the vicinity of the South Bar that we found huge piles of cobbles. And my impression is that, you know, in the 1930s, there was a tremendous interest during the Depression of reworking old, old works. And my guess is people went in there because you could still, what happens, of course, with the mercury amalgam is it works its way down into the floor of an arastra. And you can sometimes pop around the rocks and get a little of that and get a little money out of it. And people were so desperate during the Depression, I think that's what they were doing. So unfortunately, I think that the Arastras, like the one that State Park has, that did exist in Tubac, I think they were pretty much all mutilated uh, beyond recognition. The Orno Castellano and that compound had escaped all that because it wasn't even recognizable, I think, to the, uh, to the people that were there. And my guess is that, uh, you know, it was because of the peculiar nature of the ore. Now, I'm trying to remember, I think... There's a uh, 19th century depiction of, a, of an Orno Castellano at another site in southern Arizona that I recognized. And I think that was over toward, for some reason, it tells me it was in the vicinity of Aravaca. But in any event, it has to do with the mineralogy of the, of the ore deposits. But one thing's for sure, mining was a major aspect of Tubac's existence, even though it wasn't a mining camp in the sense that the mines were right there in the town. They were bringing ore in for processing. The, I guess the idea behind that was to have the relative protection of the presidio there to do that work. Would that be a correct assumption? Or I think that was certainly part of it. Part of it was, of course, you have to remember all these soldiers lived in a world where a major activity that they pursued was mining. So if they could, they were always looking for ore. And so when they were out chasing the Apaches, if they saw something that looked promising, they'd take some, take some back. Now, small batch processing, you don't use a, you don't use an arastra for that. And in fact, you can, you can do that with very limited means. And uh, one common way is to use potatoes, believe it or not. You can howl out a potato and put ore in them and with a little bit of mercury amalgam, and you can do a little tiny, tiny process. Now, you couldn't turn that into a profitable enterprise, but you could you could certainly discover one. And of course, what they were hoping was to get a really big strike, at which point there would have been a, a kind of mining flurry of activity. If you look at the history of mining in Sonora, you'll see that most of the major mines found in the colonial period were found by soldiers. And many of them, while they were like at Santa Guia, they were you know chasing Indians and they ran into uh, Bonanza. So... I don't think that ever, there wasn't clear evidence that that had happened in Tubac, but I think it, it explains in part why Poston's headquarters was there. And, and I think that there was a note that people passing through had the impression that there was mineral resources in the area. 
what was very obvious though was there were no obvious mines right in town or on the edge of town or anything like that. You'd have to get off at least a few miles away into the mountains on either either side to probably get into richer. The, the only authentic mining camp from the Spanish period in Arizona was Aravaca. So it existed as such for a brief period. And um, the best description of that is Geronimo de la Rocha's description of uh, when it was already abandoned, but he describes it. I spent a lot of time looking around Aravaca to trying to locate the original settlement, was never able to find it convincingly. But that's partly because Aravaca was so heavily reworked in the 19th century from you know mining. And Jack, going getting back to that that compound house, many of our listeners will have you know visited the Tubac Presidio State Historic Park, and they have those great rocks that kind of show the the kind of primitive outline of the Casa de Capitan. How big would you say that this Orno Castellano compound was compared to the Casa de Comandante at the, at the Tubac Presidio? It was probably about half the size of the, the Commandant's house, so it's pretty big. There is a peculiar map by Ehrenberg that shows a hexagonal based compound in Tubac. And when, when I first found it, Bunny Fontana thought, well, maybe that had some connection to it. But for the life of me, I couldn't see that connection. But what the structure basically was, was an outside sort of wall. And within that compound, there was the Orno Castellano and I think at least a couple of different structures that had adobe foot, uh, cobble footings that were like adobe structures. There may have been other informal structures in there as well that, that weren't too obvious because it, the site was a, affected in a variety of ways by erosion and various kinds of deposition and, you know, um, looking at sort of site formation processes of the site. That particular area of the site had eroded away much more than s- soils had accumulated. So the cobbles were very visible without any excavation of the outlines of the structures. And the the thing that was really obvious that right on the hard pan, which was sterile, there was just a layer of probably a couple of centimeters to maybe five or six centimeters deep of slag. It was just tons and tons of slag, which is one of the things that happens when you use this kind of mining process. You produce tons of slag. And it was pretty clearly silver. Yeah. And there was this, I can't recall whether it was the Ruby ex- inspection or the O'Connor inspection of Tubac, where he makes this comment how the the soldiers had these kind of more gaudier lined, silver lined clothing. Do you recall that? Can you, can you speak to that? Well, it, it may be in the earlier inspection. I mean, one of the things that's really fascinating that hasn't been covered a whole lot is that there was a major change in the way the garrison was uniformed between the O'Connor inspection and the Ruby inspection. At the time of the Ruby inspection, the garrison was wearing red coats with blue facings. And the uniform was actually designed by Anza. And we know a lot about it because Ruby was so impressed by it, he proposed to make it the official Presidio uniform for the entire frontier. And so he has a very detailed list of all its components. But when it came time to write the Royal Regulation of 1772, the the authors of that, who were probably more than anyone else, probably was Jose de Galvez. In any event, when they put that together, they, they, they opted for the king's livery rather than a fairly standard Spanish cavalry uniform is a red coat. And, and I think they use the term casaca in the... Uh, the ruby inspection with blue facings, but they were reversed. So they had blue uniforms with red facing. Now this has led to a lot of confusion in the artwork showing Tubac, because if you look at some of the well-known representations, you can find soldiers in red with blue facings and blue with red facings. Now at the time of O'Connor's inspection, I'm, I saw lots of evidence by that point, the, the garrison was outfitted with a new standard uniform, which was blue with red facing. So the, this also affects the first and second expeditions of Anza to California. So the first expedition, they were wearing the red outfits. The second expedition, they were wearing the blue outfits. So it's, um, it has a big, and you know, it's something that's never been included, for example, in the museum interpretations of the garrison, but that was a big change in, in their appearance. And of course, the, the Indian soldiers is another interesting question, exactly what they look like. The, uh, the San Rafael de Buena Vista garrison that was in Tubac. But there are some documents that tend to indicate that they fought with um, wearing just basically trousers. 
and they fought ha sort of, quote, half naked. And they would have certainly been equipped more with bows and arrows and with uh, clubs and, and shields, much more so than, you know, they were a very different kind of a garrison than the soldados de Cuera. And, of course, the Tubac soldados de Cuera had been transferred to Tucson, so they didn't go out of existence. They just were reassigned a new post. Jack, assessing kind of your, your background in, in historical research and also your archaeological evidence you've uncovered at Tubac, what are some of the, the, the main things about daily life in the barrios in Spanish colonial Tubac that you would like the public to know more of? Kind of like this great detail that you've just shared with us about the, the, the colors of the uniforms. Is there anything else that you think that's important that for the public consciousness about life there in the barrios? I think if I had to say some of the more important things about what it was like is that it was a strange mixture in some ways compared to like the English frontier or the French frontier in terms of the lifestyle of the population. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, there were definitely aspects of them that you would recognize as coming from Europe. A lot of their clothing, certain of the technologies they used, but there was a tremendous amount of what they did on a daily life basis, which actually came from Mexico and really dated to before the Spanish period. So whether it's using uh, monos and metates to, to process food or the interiors of the houses, which lack the kind of furnishings we're used to. I mean, these houses did not have beds and, and tables and things that we like think of colonial Williamsburg. So on the one hand, you have to think of them as being a combination of Europeans and Mesoamericans or uh, pre-contact Mexican traditions, but also local native traditions were absorbed and, and play a part. And in a very sense, the material world they lived in, like a good portion of their ceramics were Oodam ceramics. They weren't uh, Spanish at all. And, and, and of course, if you look at the historical record, you see a tremendous amount of, of local native peoples, Opata peoples and Odan people, and Indians from places as far afield as maybe New Mexico, all being absorbed into that population. So in a very real sense, the culture was a mixture of local native Mesoamerican Indian and European culture that was quite distinct. And uh, it's, in the, it's in the character of how those things blend within each region of the frontier that makes the differences over time that we can see between, say, Sonorenses, Chihuahuenses, Tejano, and California, and the Nuevo Mexicano. So, so the cultural diversity of the frontier, which we can see in documents and the archaeological record, and you can really see, for example, even looking at the churches of these various regions, that was something that was reflected in the the population as a whole. So it was, it was a, it was a distinct mixture of all those things that made them the people that they were. So, but it would have, it would have seemed sometimes strange to us. You know, you had these ladies wearing sometimes fairly fancy European clothing, um, squatting on the floor to prepare dinner. And I mean, it just, it doesn't fit our kind of pioneer colonial model based upon the English experience, which most of us are more familiar with. But the, the one exception to that, of course, was the, the, the officers. And the, the Comandancia was a very fancy house. And it, it would have had people living there. There probably, besides the family of Anza and Beldarain that lived there, there would have been a serving staff of more than a dozen people. And they lived in a pretty, pretty nice style. And that was probably the place where the unmarried soldiers resided as well, because they, they, typically they resided at the commandant's house. And of course, besides it being the center of, of, of the, the residence of the commandant, the commandante also maintained the guard house, which had a 24 hour a day guard. And in addition to that, there was also where the Presidio store would have been, which was the only commercial enterprise in, in, in Tubac in, in the Presidio era. So, and that would have been where all the goods that were shipped on an annual basis up to the frontier would have been then purchased by the soldiers, or sometimes they would have been paid in goods, in fact, I'm sure, at that facility. And people coming long distances, like uh, anyone that was up in that area that was engaged in prospecting, or the priests that needed new, you know, they needed some more paper because they ran short from the annual shipment, that's where they would go. 
So uh, Presidio stores would have been an interesting an interesting thing to see. I've never seen one fully reconstructed, either visually. Uh, we have enough documents that you could do a pretty good job of putting one together. But it was less like a, a formal store with a counter than it was a warehouse. But all of that had to be managed by the commandantes. So they were they were in the business of being merchants as much as they were soldiers sometimes. In fact, that was one of the criticisms that Ruby had of a lot of the Presidio commanders was that they were much better at being merchants than they were at being soldiers. Anza had a reputation for not doing that. Now, that remained a mansion, it was sort of like the, the one fancy house in Tubac until the abandonment of the Presidio at the end of the, uh, the, the San Ignacio del Tubac phase. That is to say, when the Presidio was transferred to Tucson, the entire settlement was uh, virtually abandoned before the new garrison was, was moved in there. And during that time period, uh, Juan Batista de Anza basically transferred the title which it had been a private residence, he transferred it to government property. So from that point on, it was a government-owned building. And so during the second Presidio occupation, it would have been a uh, publicly owned building. I suspect the com commander lived there, but it would almost certainly also have housed a, a good portion of the garrison of Obata and then later just the general garrison that, that was there. Jack, you, you touched on ceramics and kind of your brilliant uh, takeaway of, of life in Spanish colonial Tubac, the, the real the, the syncretism between the different indigenous cultures and in Spain. So kind of thinking of that, what is it that, you know, the, about the ceramics that you, you, the kind of the takeaways from that, you mentioned the fact that there was a lot of uh, mass produced locally Olam wares. But also that there would have been Maiolica, right? That lead glazed Spanish style from productions in Puebla. Could you talk about maybe the identity, the Spanish colonial identity in Maiolica and the presence of that in your excavations? Yeah, well, I, what I would say, the first thing to keep in mind is that the tin enameled wares, which are Loza Blanca de Puebla, which it was we commonly call Maiolica. It's a, it's a term that was introduced in the late 1800s, originally borrowed from the Majolica, believe it or not, which is a, a um, English word that was used for like Dutch tin enameled wares. Anyways, one way or another, it ended up getting transferred. And it, of course, it, in part, it comes from a confusion that people wondered where the tin enameled wares that got to Italy came from. And the people that brought them to Italy initially were primarily Mallorcan merchants. And so they assumed it came from Mallorca. So that's how it became Maiolica. But in colonial times, they called it Loza Blanca. And the entire amount of imported wares compared to indigenously locally produced ceramics, the imported wares represent probably less than 5% of the ceramics. So it's a small amount of the total assemblage. So if you, you know, if you dug up 100 pieces of broken pottery from Tubac, 95 of them are probably going to be either plain ware or they may be red slipped ware, which was another ceramic type made in Sonora. And there's a few other exotics, but they would all be local indigenous wares. So of that very small 5% of, of decorated wares, the great majority of those would have represented this tin enameled ware that we call Maiolica. And uh, it passed through several distinctive style changes, so it's very easy to date. And Tubac produced quite an array of different types, which are recognizable from other Spanish frontier sites. Then a very small percentage of the imported wares included Chinese porcelains. And then as the Mexican Republic period evolved over time, uh, particularly after the War of Independence period, after say the 1820s, we see increasing amounts of English ceramics, creamware and pearlware in particular, and transfer wares, which are imported in abundance to, to Mexico and then get up to the frontier. And the tin enameled ware tradition, which had centered primarily in Puebla and it had been sent north, that diminishes and finally becomes very minor and then disappears entirely. So that by the time of Poston, for example, nobody, I think, would have had anything but an antique that was still Loza Blanca. Now, some of these ceramics may not have been used so much for eating as they were for display. And of course, they're not really used for cooking. They're used for serving when they are used. But the Chinese porcelain in particular, it's quite likely it was actually not in use as a tableware, but was just put on a shelf on the wall and things like that. 
So, um, but in any event, those very fancy decorated wares are very tiny, small amount of the total population of the ceramics that are around. They're a very small amount of it. So they're not super abundant, but Tubac has a very good array of them and it's a good place to study. Of course, one of the exciting things about Tubac was that you could very much see that some of the early assumptions that had been made did not hold true. For example, Hank Dobbins in his study of um, Tubac had suggested that the really fancy ceramics would be concentrated around where the commanders lived at the Commandancia, which is, you know, commonly and over the years was called, quote, the Presidio. But in reality, we found that even it seems like the poorest person living in the South Barrio and pretty much everywhere in the North Barrio had access to them. So maybe the commander had more, a little more, but it wasn't the case that the commander was the only guy that had the Chinese porcelain. And I would say as a whole, this really pointed to something that we did learn from doing this um, very large area, which is that when compared to the lives of native peoples like at Tumacacri or at San Javier del Bac, the soldiers and their families enjoyed a great deal of more prosperity of an abundance of, of trade goods of every kind. Wow. And that included ceramics, but it also included metal objects. And so um, it's a mistake to think about the social distance of the soldiers and the commander saying like, well, this the soldiers are peasants and the commander is like a nobleman. I think it's pretty fair to say that the soldiers and their families occupied a kind of middle status position. But I got a chance to look at this carefully because in one of the projects I supervised at San Javier del Bac, they were laying a pipe trench and it went through probably six or seven old Dom houses from the late 18th century. And so I didn't get a chance to, I mean, I did what I could. It was a salvage project and I screened it. Uh, a good chunk of it. And what I could see was there were almost no trade goods there at all. Very few small amounts of bronze and brass objects, almost no decorated ceramics. And but what you would expect, the superabundance of oh, Dom plainware and redware. In, th in that case, the houses were very apparent. I, I hope that some remnant of them are still there, but it's right outside the compound of the existing um, church complex at San Javier. But in any event, it was very interesting for a comparative purpose. And that really followed the same kind of things I had seen from the work I did at the San Augustine uh, mission site in Tucson as well. Those places just didn't have a whole lot of fancy trade goods. If we compare them to missions in California, the missions in California have a much greater abundance of trade goods. In that sense, the Sonoran missions are much more like the New Mexican missions which are similarly, it's very scarce. I mean, if you find one piece of myolica or two or three pieces during maybe a six-week season of excavations, you, you found quite a bit. Another interesting structure that we never were able to explore completely was there were the remnants of a stamp mill in the North Barrio, which is not shown on the Urrutia map, but my guess may date to the post era. But it, it um, was next to, at the time, the property was owned by the Valentines, I guess. But in any event, I don't know if that, that still remains there. It was hard to get to when I visited at the time, but there was still some masonry construction yeah. there. Yeah, Nancy Valentine is still here locally in the low house. Is, is that what you're referring to or close to there? It's close to there. It was on the back side. At the, there was a there was a edge of the escarpment and then out at the base. And it was pretty clear there was a the way the water had run into the thing. But um, it was a sizable construction and there was a, it was, like I said, quite a bit of it visible above ground, although it was heavily overgrown. And my general impression was it was a stamp mill, but I, I, I didn't ever get a chance to really document it thoroughly. I'll have to ask her again. Uh, so could you, could you describe a little bit for our listeners a stamp mill, what, what exactly that is? Well, stamp mills are devices which basically allow usually water traveling through the thing, moves a series of cogs and wheels, which causes some upright elements to, to rise up and fall. And on those upright elements, which are like poles, there are large iron shoes. And those iron shoes basically crush ore. So you pour the ore through the stamp mill and it crushes the ore. And then the ore is mixed typically with the mercury amalgam and it's processed using, um, you know, uh, arastras. But that would have taken place at some distance. It's basically an ore crushing device. But it's... Um, it would make sense for it to have existed in Tubac, 
but I never saw any records indicating its existence. And I'm not, I mean, it could have been a, a grain mill from the looks of it, but grain mills don't make a whole lot of sense in Tubac. Um, one thing that the Tubac story includes is at some point when the Presidio was founded and when it was a visita, they were processing everything using monos and matates. And it's quite clear that at some point, Tahona style mills came in, which, you know, use one or two mules pushing in. They're big, giant wheels of solid stone. And there are quite a number of those that are around Tubac. And actually, while I was there, Bob Barncastle showed, showed me one that they, they accidentally ran into doing some grading on one of the properties in the North Barrio. And it was a half of one. And it was clearly not brought in from, you know, some ranch in the distance. It was something that probably had been left there. But that would have made a big difference in the daily life of the Tubacanos because they would uh, they suddenly wouldn't have to spend all day working a mono and matate. They were way more efficient at processing grain. Alrighty, Jack. Well, thank you so much for really contributing through your, your research, your years of research and excavation, this wonderful kind of window back into the past, the slice of life of what Spanish colonial Tubac would have been like in the the barrios, both the north and south barrios. I want to thank you for joining us and taking the time to communicate that with us. And we'll look forward to talking to you further in the next episode of the podcast. Again, thank you, Jack Williams of the Spanish Colonial uh, Archaeology. My pleasure to be here. Take care. Take it easy. Thank you very much for listening to this week's episode. You can find more information by visiting us at borderlandia.org. We are a binational organization committed to building public understanding of the borderlands. Thank you.